No, I showed up this morning, talked talk to some customers. Customers I talked to so far are ecstatic, so that's always, I mean, you know, there's always both kinds. I asked, <laughs> I asked the first customer, so if you had a magic wand that you could wave to change anything about NetApp, what would you change? And he was like, uh, I can't think of anything. I'm like, come on, you know, I mean, at least lower price well, is something, if everything something. working. <laughs> yeah. It's not shiny enough. Not enough green lights. So the, fortunately, the sales guy who was with us had a had a list of things like, yeah, you're you're blanking out now, but let me remind you about the stuff you beat me up. It's actually triggered a pretty good conversation. Prices are too low. Increase prices. No one's ever said that before. No one said that. No. Uh, there's a, actually increased prices. Very early on. I, it, it's funny, when we were a very small startup, we actually had a couple customers tell us to increase yeah, our prices. Value, yeah. And well, their logic was they said, we like you guys, and we don't think you're pricing to stay in business. And so yeah. we, when we look at both what we think it's gonna take for you to do, like you're teeny, you're not doing support right yet, you're not doing, you, you know, raise your prices, handle some of these other issues, we like your technology, how about you stay in, and that was 15 yeah. years ago. Yeah. But I thought that, I learned a lot from interacting with customers like that, because a customer that's telling you to raise your prices because they want you to stay in business, that's, that's a pretty savvy customer. That's a partner, dude. Yeah. That's not a customer, that's a partner. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay, we're good. Dave Vellante is on a plane. Yeah, he's on a plane. He'd love to tell the NetApp story where you guys were in your offsite planning meeting, and um, when you guys came to the point that I can, we can do a billion dollars. He loves to tell that story because it's the classic Silicon Valley story. You think, hey, we're growing so fast. Well, that's the yeah, difference between so engineering and sales. I mean, my model for sales was, hey, we doubled last year. If we just keep doubling every year for five years, we'll hit a billion dollars. Yeah. And Tom Mendoza, who was he the head of sales crazy. at he that time, he's like, he says, but you can't just do that. And I said, sure I can. Look, it's actually $1.3 billion, <laughs> Tom. He's like, I'm not signing up for that. <laughs> but we did. Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, we did. And then we hit a billion long about late 2000. And I don't know, there was this tech crash thing. Okay, so you're the co-founder of NetApp. It's a big success story in Silicon Valley and a big successful company here. You guys have a monster booth. You guys are doing great financially. Um, what's it like now for you? I mean, you're in the company. You're actively involved. You wrote a book recently about entrepreneurship and you know, the startup process. How to castrate a bull. We might as well plug the book. How to castrate a bull. Uh, is it on the Kindle and Amazon and uh, uh, oh, iPad bookstore? Yeah. Okay, go get it. How to castrate a bull. Can't forget that title. <laughs> talk about talk about just your personal experiences right now, where you are in the company, and then. So first of all, I mean, it's just been weird being the founder of a company that's so successful. People often do ask me, "What does that feel like?" And you know, like you look at these buildings, you created all of this. The best analogy I, I've been able to come up with is like if you plant a seed and an oak tree grows, you can come back 10 years later and you see there's an oak tree, but if someone says, how does it feel to have created this oak tree? It's like, well, it feels good. Uh, I mean, it, it feels, feels great, it's, it's feels awesome. You, you know? But but it, you planted a seed, like a lot of other magic happened, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah, yeah. Uh, just because you planted the seed doesn't mean you get all the credit. It's sort of a group effort. Where was your but, experience in terms of the inflection point where you, where you personally looked at yourself and said, wow, we're going to actually make it? Was it at the beginning? Was it early stage? When you, you know, it, there's, It's been a series of inflection points. The early inflection points were so we were doing storage for the Ethernet originally. It was just Ethernet storage. And, and the thing, and we started in 91. So we actually incorporated in 92. There was no internet then. I mean, there was the internet officially, but there was no yeah. web. There wasn't, yeah, you know, was, the whole web thing. I think, when did Netscape ship? 90, 94, 95 four, came yeah. out, 94, 95. It, so we started three years yeah. before that. When that stuff started to kick in, everybody in the world was trying to leverage ethernet for everything they could. Yeah. And that really, when we started getting customers, like the early ones were, were Earthlink, MindSpring, AOL, like those kind of guys. Amazon was actually an early customer. That, that was like this, but so that was the first inflection point was really riding the dot-com curve. After the crash, that was problematic. I mean, because yeah, yeah. most of our customers had been tech or internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the next transition was enterprise. You know, how do we just go be a grown-up company dealing with grown-up customers and like, you know, a big yeah, boy. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and I would say the most recent inflection point, and it's the one we're largely in, is all about VMware. I mean, yeah. when people start to look at VMware, they think differently about how the storage infrastructure should fit that. We, it, I can't tell you the customer name, unfortunately. We had an enormous company 
who had named EMC, the, their vendor of the year, the previous year, switched to NetApp. Not because they were unhappy in any way with EMC, but because as they rolled out VMware, they believed we were a better foundation for that environment. I, when you look, I mean, NetApp has been growing like gangbusters in the, for the past couple yeah, of years. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and I have to say, I think one of the key drivers for that is VMware. So we had Tom Georges on at the, our uh, Cube at uh, VMworld, which is, to me, a very groundbreaking show. I like show Tom. He, he's our new CEO. He's been CEO for just over a year he, now. He was great. And we asked all the CEOs, uh, Joe Tucci, the same question, is storage sexy and, or, <laughs> is it, or is it hot? He goes, and he said, I love it. I don't care if it's hot or sexy, as long as it's profitable. Right. <laughs> and he's just so candid, and, but he was really good. He nailed it. So, hey, let me give you my answer. I think storage is like plumbing. Right? You're going to build a house. Nobody looks first at the plumbing, but you go in that house, if the plumbing's not working right, it's not very long before you're extremely unhappy. Yeah, very unhappy. And, and it's, but no, I mean, this. what's sexy? The sexy thing is the app that puts this yes. solves the business problem in front of your face. Cold water, uh, yes. Clean, cold water coming through the pipes. If, we, if NetApp was a Hollywood actor, we could never yeah. aspire to be the best, the leading man. We have to be the best supporting actor. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's, you know, so, but yeah, but as Tom says, that that's a profitable business. The, uh, the other thing he talked about was um, pivot, pivoting off of uh, Moritz's piece about 50, um, virtual machines shipping more than physical units and the impact of what that's going to do with the software. Um, because, you know, storage was hard, it's hardware, but there's a lot of software in there. Tell us about some insights that you see happening here with VMware environments, with software, what's the innovation angle there? Is there... So here's one of my observations about VMware. I talk to really smart tech guys, like, you know, the engineering nerds, and they say, Boy, if you've got an environment like VMware where everything is virtualized, you could build a completely different model of computing. I mean, nodes could communicate like this. They wouldn't have to use TCP. They could, everything could be shared. That's not what's happening. If you look what's happening, people are actually reconstructing all of the environment of their physical data center, but they're doing it virtually. I mean, you look at VMware, they're, they're starting to develop encapsulization of different things, and yeah, we can yeah. move these groups of systems, and it's not like people are migrating to all direct memory access, it's still TCP IP. Why is that? Hmm. The reason is, if you look at the infrastructure required to run a data center, some of it's about chips and OS's, a lot of it is about the processes, how you actually make this stuff fit together, the rule book you've put together to yeah, run yeah. it, the stuff that you've got thousands of IT people trained up to do, and so you end up with Cisco doing things like putting virtual routers into VMware. Is that the most efficient way to move bytes back and forth? No, but it matches the processes yeah, yeah, you've yeah. set up. Yeah. Is that a legacy issue or is there going to be a force that's going to come around the corner and hit us? Because uh, there's always a, that disruptive one big bullet that hits the and, and in that context, talk about talk about performance and, and, and particularly performance and storage and, and what you're doing to to try I, to address some so, of that. So you know, there's these trends all over. I I have to say, I think server virtualization. And it's not just VMware. If you look at things like Oracle's Rack or Hyper V, Microsoft's Hyper V. I mean, yeah. but any of that stuff, yeah. Sun's got a lot of those capabilities, or I guess Oracle now and in, in there. But all of the the flavors of virtualization. That is the single biggest change to hit IT in a long time. And if you look at the savings people get, it, that's going to be 10 years before we full un, fully understand it. And But but I want to switch to storage. I am a storage guy. I think the, one of the most interesting trends right now in storage from a cost perspective is taking flash. So flash is the expensive memory oh, that yeah. goes in SSDs. Everybody knows it's yeah. beautifully fast but horribly expensive. Combine it with SATA drives, which are the cheap ass drives, right? combine those together and use it to make something that's about the same speed as you got now, but half the price. I think if you look over the next five years, Flash plus SATA is basically going to eliminate fiber channel and, and say the 15,000 RPM enterprise class drive. Because of the it's, caching layer that it provides? Is that the solid state? No, more because it's caching? half the price. Just a pure economic yeah. boom. And, and what's the impact on power? It's, what's the impact on space? It, it's, you know, if you hmm, look that's at... That's interesting. If you, so we've seen this before, actually. If you, if you look back 20 years, everybody 20 years ago, they had almost 30 years, some of it, IBM DASD drives, remember these drives, yeah, the yeah. size of a washing machine spinning flies, around, right? 14, I mean, the early ones were bigger than that. Yeah, yeah. And they were spinning around. Um, there was this little company came along and they said, let's take cheap Unix drives, the SCSI workstation drives, let's put a layer of memory on, it was a memory company, let's put some RAID in, 
and, and, and that company in a five-year period went from less than 10% market share to over 50. It's EMC, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, it's the exact same. These things, you don't get to choose them. You know, these technology trends kind of come when they yeah. come. Back then, it was the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the SCSI drive and the invention of RAID. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. It's, it's the SATA drive and flash memory combining. You, so, so to me, yeah, yeah. as a, a vendor, good? we can ride that curve. Yeah. But as a customer, you can either choose to be on the, the old expensive stuff or the new cheap, fast stuff. So in that case, it changed leadership positions. Is it going to change leadership positions this time? Or is, it, or is everybody so, going to have it? Certainly... Everyone recognizes that Flash is awesome, yeah, yeah, and yeah. a lot of people are starting to recognize that SATA is awesome. Yeah. I don't think, it's not fair at all to say NetApp's the only company that spotted this trend. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think we have a big lead. Yeah. We, we spotted 10 years ago the trend that you could use SATA drives, or ATA drives they were originally, that you could use them for tape replacement. Yeah, you did it in the near and, store product. Uh, the yeah. near store product, and, and that early on was an odd bet to a lot of people, yeah. and, and that's kind of the way the industry's gone. So what's the point? We've been shipping these kind of drives for 10 years now. We know how to do it. We're shipping more SATA drives than any other um, enterprise storage system vendor. Yeah, I mean, on the cost side, I mean, so that's, that's one element, but cost is not, doesn't always equate to value. Is there a, a point where there's a, there's a tipping point where you got to say real value change? So here's where the value happens. Suppose, just hypothetically, yeah, yeah. that you would like to build a shared storage infrastructure to go under a virtualized server environment. Mm -hmm. So one of the big challenges you have is you've got all of these different applications mm -hmm. and they've got different requirements. Some of them need super high performance, some of them lower performance is okay, some of them they've got different availability requirements. So here you want to build this, this storage infrastructure. How do you build a single infrastructure that serves all these different needs. I mean, and you could say, well, well, let's have a bunch of different tiers and we'll migrate stuff back and forth and we'll try and manage that whole thing. And certainly, yeah. all of the storage vendors have gone down that. But wouldn't it be cool if you had a technology where you could say, if you want it cheaper, use more of the SATA. If you want it faster, use more yeah, of yeah. the flash. And by the way, yeah. you can Turn tune this back and yeah. forth dynamically. With management. It'll Software. It'll tune automatically if you want it to, if you want to specifically say, you know, Joe's no yeah. good, don't let him. So that's where we're headed, yeah, yeah. where it's all dynamic and automated. Yeah, yeah. You don't, now, will there still be certain silos where you want 100% pure SSDs or 100%? There'll be some zones, but if you can make most of it be dynamically tuning automated, you've changed this from an economics argument to what's the right way yeah. flexibly to build a shared storage infrastructure. I think that's game changing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't. I was just having a talk to someone at Stanford in the computer science department. I mean, the big debate going on right now is do you scale out or do you scale up? And then, both. And, and how do you do both? I mean, scaling out, that's more of a Facebook kind of issue, but there's distributed calls. There's some issues there, right? <laughs> scaling up is throwing money at it, but more complexity there. How, how do people think about So that? just to how make sure we've got the, the definitions right, scaling out a lot of people mean is just more and more and more small systems, just like build everything out of PCs, more, and scaling up is like just build honking yeah. systems, so invest scaling, a lot in the R&D Scaling out is just I'll put it everywhere and not worry about partitions, worry about calls, distributed calls. So I'm trying to find one piece of data distributed on multiple places, kind of like all the Facebook paradigm, just right. dump blobs out there, and then scaling up is you know all the, the, the current storage, you guys, EMC, um, and no one's perfected this distributed model yet, because of the round trip times, all kinds of issues, right? So, but that's what people are thinking about right now. You have different requirements and you're going to need both. So, we, we were talking before about how long does it take for data center transitions to occur? Right, I mean, people still run mainframes, yeah, yeah. right? These yeah, things yeah. take this forever. This was a guy years ago. There, there are a lot of apps that aren't going to be retuned anytime soon to be widely parallelized. And because of those apps, you're going to need very scale up storage yeah. systems to accommodate them. That said, there's a lot of other apps. I, we've started doing business early on with Yahoo, you know, for things like their, their email and a lot of, of their individual customer data. They call it refrigerator magnet data. And the reason they call it that is because this is like a picture that you took of your kid and you want grandma to be able to see it. If, if you didn't have a digital copy, the place you'd put it was on your refrigerator. Yeah. So it's all this refrigerator yeah. magnet data. And the access pattern of that is look at once and then never again, but maybe. Right? I mean, so you, you just, you can't, the same architecture is not going to do both. You, you need to, you need to, for that, scale out, scale, I mean, this way. <laughs> scale breadth as opposed to up is going to be the right model. 
So question to wear two hats. So wear two hats right now. The seasoned uh, NetApp executive, been through the ringer, a lot of scar tissue, grown a company, planted a seed, to an innovator, a guy who's now a startup. You're on, on just say you're in the trenches, you're spinning up a new startup. What, what do you say to the folks out there that are out there trying to figure out the future and innovate? What should they be looking at? What's your advice to them? Because a lot of entrepreneurs are trying to kick this private car Here's, tires. Here is my advice. My advice is I spent a year writing a book that captured all of the thoughts that read, I had on read, this subject. Read, read How to Get a Maestro <laughs> Book. Um, the, for me, I think the most influential book on business thinking, maybe the, the pair of them, is Jeffrey Moore, Crossing the Chasm, yeah. Inside the tornado and crossing the chasm, those two, and Clayton Christensen, um, the innovator's the dilemma. Innovator's and innovator's and the key message of the innovator's dilemma to me is, don't start your company to go head to head with exactly the same thing some big guys doing. Yeah, like that's Oracle. Just, that's just not. No, why <laughs> would you? Anyone. Do, right. Not anybody. Figure out some little niche which is different than what they're doing that over time can potentially grow in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when we started, we were doing storage over Ethernet at a time when everyone believed Ethernet sucked yeah. and that no one in their right mind would put anything valuable on it. And that was not a bad little niche. Programmers, yeah, yeah. people using Sun You learned a lot. You had a position and, in the marketplace. You can get customers. And then we were enormously lucky, which is the Internet hit, and everybody said, well, let's rethink this Ethernet thing. Maybe we should put valuable data on it. it but you can't plan that. So, but, I mean, head-to-head -head with the giant guys, sell 